Good afternoon, everybody. And this is P7 Advanced Audit and Assurance for the March 2018 sitting. And this is revision class number one out of five. So let me first tell you how the course is going to work in terms of structure and what we're going to use. Um, and then we can just get down to business and get moving on it. We have got five revision classes. For those of you who've done revision with us at previous sittings, we used to do four revision classes. Hello! Four revision classes of two and three quarter hours each with a 15 minute break in the middle. Uh, we have decided for a number of reasons to move towards five two hour revision classes. We will just have a small five minute or so break in the middle just to let us catch our breath but basically otherwise it will be straight through. So you end up with the same amount of time, but in smaller bite size chunks. So just in case there is any confusion as to timings, our five classes run, two of them today, from now three o'clock until five o'clock. Uh, you then get a one hour break. Uh, I do not, as I'm doing some P1 in the gap. And then from six till eight, we have class number two. In one week's time, we repeat the experience, three till five, six till eight, and then that leaves us with one final class to mop up a few final things in the week before the exam. Ooh. So after those five revision classes, we also have a one hour final Q&A mentoring session. Now at the moment, off the top of my head, I honestly cannot remember when that final mentoring session is. Uh, but typically, uh, I try to time it on either the Thursday or the Friday uh, just before the exams on the following Monday. Uh, I warn you now, that one hour session tends to be a bit chaotic as people who we've not seen or heard of all term all seem to turn up at once and ask a million questions, uh, some of which are along the lines of how do I pass this paper? And it's a little bit late to be asking that five seconds before exam day. So I would advise those of you on revision to try to ask as many of the questions as you've got during the course, if at all possible. Uh, otherwise, that final session um, can go a little bit crazy. Uh, right, materials. What will we be using during these five sessions? I will do some technical revision up on the screen. But I will also have at my disposal each time uh, this thing here and this 40 to 50 page document is the December 14 exam that runs then all the way through to the end of the September December 2017 exam. So we have the last four years pretty much of exam papers uh, all sitting with us. They're uploaded on Canvas as well. And uh, we will be doing a selection of those questions. I will also be suggesting others for you to do as homework exercises that we can then review at the start of the following session. Uh, obviously, I will not be setting you homework at the end of session one because one hour later, session two begins. You'd have no time to do it. But at the end of sessions two and four, I'll be suggesting specific exercises. <clears throat> um, also up on uh, Canvas, uh, I don't have it here because I already know what I'm doing, uh, is a suggestion of how I break the questions down between the must-dos and the should-dos. Now I suppose there's also a could-do after the musts and the shoulds. Uh, the could-dos are any other questions you have at your disposal. So 2013 and going backwards, I suppose. Uh, but we will be focusing on the last four years as everything we could want to see has come up at some point in that four year period. I won't necessarily be doing all of the must questions during our five sessions. Uh, this is simply because that uh, revision analysis planner is not just for this live course where we have a total of 10 hours. 
It also covers me for a three-day campus revision course where we have more hours. And more hours means more questions. My aim for these five sessions is quite simply to cover enough of a range of questions that we cover all of the core question types likely to come up. And where there is a bit of, ooh, I wonder which one we're going to get, you know, like the non-audit assignments, which one might it be? Obviously, we want to do more than one of those to hedge our bets a bit. So that is the aim. I've tried to tie the questions in a little bit at least with some of the tips that I think could come up because obviously we want to practice the most relevant stuff. Uh, so that is how things are going to work. Whenever we do a question, I will put it up on the screen uh, so you can see what we are working on. Uh, what else do I need to tell you? Uh, I suppose the next thing I should say is if you are a UK stream student, the vast majority of the questions we are doing are exactly what you will see on exam day. However, if you are doing UK, there are two main things you need to be aware of. In fact, I'm not going to write these up here, Oy, because this is aimed at international stream. Um, if you are doing UK stream, please email me and I will send you uh, a short document telling you what you need to do to convert your international stream approach slightly into UK stream. Uh, there is at least one person who has emailed me and I have not responded yet. It's on my to-do list. I will deal with it. So if that's you, absolutely. Do we have answer models for the questions from 2014 to 17? Anything up to the end of 2015, so the first half of those, uh, are all in the uh, question bank on Canvas. So that covers 2014-2015. Uh, 2016, uh, March, June is not yet in our question bank on Canvas. I will get that posted up separately for you. Uh, I have some of the remainder of 2016 and 17, but definitely not all because we're not due to actually have written them yet, but I do have some. Um, of course, we'll be doing some of them up on the screen, so you'll be getting my answer plans and therefore content, and some of it written in full, but not all of it, up on the screen. Where can we find the questions to must do? Uh, they're on Canvas. There is a revision planner. Uh, if it's not up on Canvas, right at this very second, uh, it's all confirmed, so it should be going up any second. Um, to be honest, it doesn't really tell you much that you need right at this present moment, because the questions that I'm planning to do, we will, of course, will do. Uh, and anything I'm setting as homework, I'll be telling you as well. Okay, uh, right, let's get down to business then. And take a look at what it is that we are trying to get through. The P7 exam. What are you going to see? You are going to see five questions. They are going to be worth 35 marks, 25 marks, 20, 20, and 20. Now, of course, she might possibly, perhaps, try to do something a little bit left field, but to be frank, she never does. And given the pass rate on this exam is far from wonderful, I would be very surprised, in fact, shocked if she tried doing it now. So what can you expect in those five questions? Well, one thing that is a certainty is that question one will be an audit plan because it always is. As far as the question numbering is concerned, that is the only guarantee 
But the next most definite thing that seems to happen is that question five always seems to be some sort of reporting thing. The other three questions could in theory uh, be mixed up a bit, but the three topics of the, those other three questions are going to be a non-audit assignment. You'll get some sort of matters and evidence, accounting issues type question and some sort of ethics, professional issues, and just to be clear, professional issues includes practice management, so quality control and that sort of thing. Maybe I'll put quality control separately just to make that clear. So that could be there, that could be there, and that could be there. So apologies for the rather attractive diagram, but you get the point. The fact is there are five things you need to be able to get your head around. So we will make sure that we focus our practice on all five. The one slightly annoying thing with that is that the top two are compulsory questions and the last three are options. You've got to do two of them. Which means some of you who are looking to be efficient in your revision perhaps, I don't know what you want to call it, cutting corners could be another way of looking at it, might be staring at those options at the moment and thinking, right, if push comes to shove and I'm running out of revision time, could I drop something and then hope it's not in question two compulsory? Um, my advice on that is you just can't do it. Look, there's only five things, five skills here. You've got to get your head around. So do all five. It's not that much. That would be my advice. Um, <clears throat> in terms of how she seems to pick question number two, it seems that the more technical, especially accounting wise, question one is, the more likely it is that question two won't be accounting in order to just balance out the technical hardship of the questions you can't avoid. In other words, if question one is a big audit risk question, I doubt question two will be matters and evidence because that's more accounting. More likely it will be an ethics -y, quality control-y question or a non-audit question. If on the other hand we get business risk in question one, meaning there'll be less accounting because risk of material misstatement will probably be there as well. In that case, matters and evidence is often question two, just to make it uh, balanced in terms of the technical content. So those are the question types we are looking to get done. And whenever we come up with a question type, the first thing we'll do is think through the technique we should be following, and then we'll apply that technique <coughs> excuse me, that technique to that question and prove that it works. Uh, we've had the same exam structure for P7 for about 10 years. Uh, the only slight difference in that was the marks arrangements have changed slightly. Uh, but apart from that, two compulsory, three optional, same core topics. So it's a very predictable exam. Very predictable indeed. Which, of course, raises the question. If P7 is so predictable, why is the pass rate so bad? If we all know what's going to happen and there's loads of past exam questions and answers for us to look at, why is the pass rate so bad? Why are there so many students out there, more than on any other of ACCA's papers, who fail P7 over and over and over again? 
To which there is a very, very simple answer. We all know exactly what's going to happen during our driving test. And yet, whereas some people do their driving test once, sail through it and don't know what all the fuss is about, there are others who fail their driving test 400 times in a row. There are some exams where if you put in loads of hours, do loads of questions, and you really know your stuff, you can't fail. Because there's such a reward for knowledge. If that exam has calculations on it, your knowledge translates into doing the calculations right, you're bound to get marks. With P7, there are virtually no calculations involved. And the problem with P7 is you can't just memorize stuff. P7 is a real test of whether you understand things. And there are so many students who seem to think that memorising the textbook is the way to pass this exam, especially those who are self-studying and not getting the advice of someone who actually knows how to pass the exam, that a lot of people fail it because they've memorised some sentences, but when they get an actual question come up, they've got no idea how to approach it. Passing this paper is like passing your driving test. You need an instructor who can say to you, look, I used to be the examiner at the driving test centre. So I know that when I say reverse around this corner, there are things I am looking for and things that I'm not that bothered about. I know when you're driving along during your driving test, there are things I am looking for and things I am not that bothered about. Well, if you know what the examiner is looking for, it makes life a lot easier, doesn't it? Because now you know, just do it. Don't question why you should do it. The answer's simple. Examiner likey, you doey. Yes? Now, I used to be an audit examiner a long time ago. Not for this paper, for another uh, institute. But I used to be an audit examiner. More importantly, I mark the P7 exam. I am not marking at the sitting you are sitting at, so put your money back in your wallets and don't try to bribe me. It's naughty. But the point is, when you're a marker, you know what the examiner's looking for because the markers don't just see the question, answers and marking guide that you see. As markers, we get a much more detailed explanation of why some things get marks and why some things don't. Now I must stress, given the pass rate, the markers are all under a lot of encouragement that if they think someone deserves marks, give them. Don't sit there going, ooh, I'm not sure. Err on the side of generosity if someone seems to know what they're doing. We are trying to help people pass. But if you don't know what you're doing and you're talking absolute rubbish, then there is no hope of you passing. I get a little annoyed by the number of students who get 35, 36 and then say, I'm going to protest my mark. Well, don't. If you're getting in the mid 30s, you are really in trouble because you are miles away from understanding how to pass this. If you're scoring that sort of score, no, you did not pick the wrong question to do. No, you did not screw up one part of a question. If you're scoring 36, then you are doing multiple things wrong on multiple questions. Anything less than 45 on here and your technique is not good enough. Right, so why is the pass rate so bad? All of you, given that we are less than three weeks before exam day, should know right now how to approach each of the various question types. If you don't know that at the moment, you are hideously underprepared. This is a professional exam with a poor pass rate. If you're sitting here right now, totally incapable of doing any questions, well, I will do my best to help you out, 
but you should be further close to preparation than this. This is like an Olympic athlete three weeks before the Olympics strapping on some running shoes and saying, right, I better start doing some training then. No, it's a bit late really, isn't it? So I'll help you as best I can, but if you currently have no technique, that is very worrying. Second reason why the pass rate is so bad. It's tempting here to write lack of knowledge. But I prefer to write lack of understanding. Too many students memorise sentences and have no idea what they actually mean. I mean, take financial instruments. Oh yeah, value them at fair value, through profit or loss. Congratulations, nice bit of memory. Do you actually have any idea what that means? What it means in practice? Could you give me an example, for example? Uh, and most students can't. They've learned the words, but they don't actually know what it means. So when it comes up in a question, they can state the words, but applying them, no chance. Hello. Whatever the examiner says, as a marker, I think a lack of understanding of accounting standards loses people more marks than a lack of understanding of audit standards. But it is an audit exam. And too many students, despite the fact all the audit standards are on, uh, are on uh, F8, so you should have known them on F8, simply don't have the brought forward knowledge because frankly they didn't have it on F8 either. And as I said during the mentoring session yesterday, if there's one bit of knowledge and understanding uh, for P7 from the audit standards that people often are really weak on, and you know it's going to come up somewhere, is audit reports. Got to get your head around that. What is in scope? IFRS 9 or IFRS 39? I think you'll find we're only up to 17 on the IFRSs. IAS 39. Uh, as we currently stand, it's IFRS 9. I think there's a little bit of 39, but who cares where it comes from? And the good news is, as with all the standards, she doesn't test the really nasty bits of the standards much. She tends to focus on good old core stuff. As I said, fair value through profit or loss is the more likely way that a financial instrument is going to be valued. It's not the only way, I know that. But for P7, if you know that, you probably just about know enough. If you know that financial instruments create huge amounts of disclosures, including their impact on the risk of the company, so a sort of IFRS 7 thing, then you probably know enough about that. As long as you know the basics of each accounting standard, that should be plenty. <clears throat> um, one other reason people fail Is lack of practice and that I'm afraid means writing out answers and as a result of that we have a problem with explanations which are either not there at all or are just very weak vague general meaningless basically so to give you an example, uh, when we do an ethics question and we see a threat to independence, if you write this is a threat to independence, I doubt you'll score anything. There are six different types of threat to independence, and if you're not prepared to say which of those you think it is, kiss goodbye to some marks. Got to be specific. I would inspect the relevant document, says the student. Would you now? Would you like to tell me which relevant document? I mean, there's lots of documents in the world. Be specific. T. 
tell me what you would do as specifically as possible and why you are doing it as specifically as possible. So there are some of the reasons. Uh, that I think is as much as I would want to say right now. Uh, we're going to start off with a little bit of technical revision first. I'll be interspersing some technical amongst the questions and then into our first question of the revision class. Uh, bu -bu -bu. Yes, uh, can I also say please attempt the mock exam at some point. There's plenty of time for you to do it. Don't try to wait until the end of revision. That's too late to be getting feedback on your performance. The sooner you do it, the sooner I can give you some feedback. And if you're thinking, oh, but I won't be ready for it now, the exam's only three weeks away. You should be pretty close to ready now. What I should be doing is topping you up, not taking you from zero to hero, but from mm, sort of hero to hero. Uh, and anyway, who cares if you're not ready fully? Have a go at it. And yeah, when you get it back, you might look at my feedback and go, well, yeah, but I'm doing it differently. Now. Well, good. Then you've solved it, haven't you? Fantastic. I don't know whether to be happy with this or sad, but so many of my mock marks are so similar to what students then get on the real exam that I do get a little bit nervous that on exam day, people are doing exactly what they did on the mock and not improving much because maybe they've not had the time to consider the improvements they need to do. I did a little research uh, after the December sitting. Uh, it was nice to see in total, for those students who've told me their real score in December, their real exam performance for all the students in total was on average 10 to 15% better than what they did on the mock. So there is some scope to improve. But if you're scoring 40, 10% better than 40 is 44. And that's not going to be enough, is it? Right, enough. You get the idea. Technique, technique, technique. So let's get going. And what we're going to do to start off is a little technical revision. And then we'll get straight into our first question of revision. Let us start with an audit standard, number 250, on the subject of laws and regulations. And this is not laws and regulations that affect the auditor, but laws and regulations that affect our audit clients. Now, there are quite a few audit standards out there, about 32 of them, I think, in total. Um, so anything could come up. Uh, but this one does come up on a relatively regular basis, partly because it doesn't come up much on the F8 exam, I suspect. But also, in the second half of last year, there was an examiner article related to this called... No clar. And where there is an examiner article, what does that tell us? It tells us the examiner is interested in this subject. So, a little reminder. All audit standards, all of them, are about the auditor's duties. So, our starting point is to ask ourselves, what are the auditor's duties? regarding laws and regulations at clients. Well, our main duty, of course, as an auditor, is to give an opinion on the truth and fairness of the financial statements. That is our primary job. So what, then, is the relevance of laws and regulations okay. 
to our opinion on the truth and fairness of the financial statements. Well, if your client breaks laws and regulations, surely that is likely to lead to fines. And the moment we see that a company is likely to be fined for things it has done in the past, before its year end, we should be thinking accounting standard 37, and they're likely to need a provision in the accounts. If, on the other hand, they seriously break laws and regulations, well, again, fines may be possible. But also now it may create a going concern threat and IAS1 says a disclosure note is needed in the financial statements. So this is our primary reason for caring about our client's laws and regulations. If our client is mucking things up, it creates provisions and potentially a going concern threat. Uh, there's a nice example going on at the moment. Well, it's not a nice example, but there's an example. Uh, in the United Kingdom, a charity, which most of us have heard of, called Oxfam, is accused of doing naughty things, or at least some of its staff did, while helping out after a big earthquake in Haiti uh, about seven, eight years ago. Well, that could cause that charity some problems. Uh, what they are accused of doing in Haiti is against Haitian law, and if they didn't fully cooperate with the authorities at the time, they might now be charged retrospectively with criminal acts. This could lead to the charity being fined. I suppose. But given the amount of adverse publicity this is get, uh, getting the charity, it's likely to cause problems for them going forward. Government gives a lot of money to this charity for aid relief, might decide not to, and people might stop donating to it. Now, I'm not suggesting, probably, that Oxfam is going out of business. It's a charity. I'm sure they'll survive but you can see the potential for trouble here. That's the main relevance. So if you discover a breach at a client, what should the auditor do? Well, consider the financial statement impact, as we've just done, see above. But if your client is breaking some rules, you need to make sure you tell the client. Let management know. Discuss this with their audit committee. And then, you need to consider telling an external party. Probably the industry regulator for that industry. So I suppose the Charities Commission, if you were the auditor of Oxfam, if you'd spotted this. Uh, I suppose possibly the police, depending on what the matter is. Now it's that point there which the examiner's article from last year was focusing on. No, Clar. <laughs> Sorry, that's not going to work. You'd think the number of times I've done this and realized that I'd have got it right by now, but no. Uh, non clar stands for non Compliance with 
laws and regulations. NOCLAR is an updated uh, requirement for auditors with some guidance to say, look, in the past, when auditors spot non-compliance, because they don't want to upset their clients and cause a fuss, they will often say, oh, client confidentiality, I don't really think I need to report this to anybody else. As long as the clients dealt with it themselves, leave them to it. The NOCLAR regulations say, no, auditors, stop it. If you think your client has not complied, make sure you tell the client to report it to the authorities. And if they don't, you probably will. Presumably, because you think that even if there's no law forcing you to disclose it, you're going to argue that whatever you found is in the public interest. The NOCLAR guidance also says that the auditor should document the whole process of considering this issue and all the conversations with the client must be recorded, put in writing to make it clear that you spotted something, you thought about it and your decision on whether to report it. There is also clarity in the new NOCLAR guidance that says that you will definitely not be breaching client confidentiality if you report a breach because you think it's public interest. If you genuinely are doing this for the right reasons, nobody can come back and say you should not have told anybody. So it's not making a massive difference to the old system, it's just trying to shake the audit firms up a bit and say, look, you guys are meant to be reporting things and you're not, so we're going to tighten it up a bit and say, look, report it. Uh, one other thing, by the way, uh, if you do discover a breach at the client, you should probably also consider resignation on the grounds of the client's lack of integrity. But resignation is not in place of reporting to the authorities. So no resigning and then saying it's not my problem anymore. Even if you've resigned, if you think it's a public interest issue, you need to report it. Now, as is common with all the recent examiner articles, uh, I have done my own summary of those articles. And I'm just going to make a little note here, if this pen will work, to upload those to Canvas for you, uh, as I don't think I've done it yet. Uh, I'm not going to go crazy and upload loads, just the more recent ones, so you know you're covered if one of the recent ones comes up. Right, so that was ISA 250, a little bit of knowledge to get our brains up and running but enough of that. It is time for our first question of the day. And we're going to start with a matters and evidence question. And our first one is going to be December 2014. And question number two. It won't be the only one we're doing, but we'll start with that. So let's go take a look all the way back to the first exam paper in this pack. That's December 14, question one. 
And here is December 14, question number two. So if I was doing the exam paper, how do I begin? Well, I can see it's worth 25 marks because it's question number two. No problem there. I go straight into the requirements first. And what do I see? Comment on the matters to be considered and explain the audit evidence you should expect to find during a review of the audit working papers in respect of each of the issues described above. Always read the entire requirement. There is a danger you might get another requirement that says matters to consider, but then says matters to consider when deciding whether to accept appointment, or matters to consider in completing the audit. It might not be the same as this, so read the whole thing. But this is a typical matters and evidence question. As a result of that, the moment I see the word matters, I think, ha ha, I know what to do with that. I need to highlight the relevant accounting rules. Has the client done it right? And if I can't tell, what's the risk of them doing it wrong? And I need to assess materiality. If and only if I can see that it is materially wrong, I'll mention the audit report as well. But only if, based on what I'm reading, I think they've definitely got it materially wrong. Now, immediately, I can see a problem. Not a problem for me, I hope, because I know my accounting standards and accounting rules, but a problem for most of you. If you do not know what the relevant accounting rules are, then when you try and explain them, you'll get nowhere. You have no idea if the client's done it right or not, and as a result, you can't talk about the audit report with any confidence. Now, I'm not trying to put you off. I'm just trying to be realistic. That is the toughest bit of this style of question. Materiality, on the other hand, is easy. So surely, go get the materiality mark or marks. If there's a lot of numbers, there might be more than one mark for materiality. The absolute maximum would be two, and normally it's only one. Go get a materiality mark, and at least that way, with three scenarios in this question, we're at three out of 25, and we've got some marks on the board. I then see audit evidence and I think, okay, well, the auditor should have collected evidence to match the accounting rules that need to be checked. But I'm not sure I know what the accounting rules are. Help. So I think, ah, think, A-E-I-O-U. Is there any analytical they should have done? Any questions, inquiries they should have asked? Anything they could have inspected, observed or recalculated? If that doesn't get you enough, think da da three. What documents could they have inspected? What assets could they have inspected? Should they have asked the directors to confirm things in writing? Should they have looked and checked in the accounting books, cash book, sales day book, inventory register? Or are there any third parties they should have got confirmation from? And with those 10 things, A-E-I-O-U, D-A-D-A-3, that might help you generate enough. But the more and more I look at these questions, the more I realize that if you simply test or check every fact, event, amount in the story, you're probably going to have enough. You might not realize why you are checking that amount or that fact or that event. Just do it and say you're doing it to check whatever the details are that are given to you. Now, if you do have good accounting knowledge, that is beautiful and you're gonna love these questions. But please remember, accounting knowledge is only part of the marks. 
at least half the marks are the audit evidence, and that makes the audit evidence more important than the accounting. It's also easier. So as those of you who've been with me during term will know, I believe that the best tactics here are to test every item in the story, calculate materiality, focus on doing the easier things first, and then drop the accounting related stuff into your answer afterwards. Now, of course, I have written a lot on the face of that exam paper. If I was actually doing the paper, I wouldn't write as many words. I'm writing that many words because I am trying to persuade you, which means you need to understand what I'm writing. On exam day, I would probably be writing a quarter of that, if that. At the start of the exam, on March the 5th, I would go through all five questions and do something like that. Write my tactics down. Because at the start of the exam, your tactics should be there. Your technique should be ready to go. Do it for all the questions at the beginning. And then when you start your final questions towards the end of the exam, when you're tired, the arm is really struggling, the brain is beginning to go, the tactics will have gone from your head. If you've written them down at the start, they're there staring at you whenever you go back to a question. Right, so that is our preparation done. And to a great extent, that is what's going to pass or fail you. Because having done that, you now know what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And the only other thing that applies to everything you write on this exam, explain every point you make. Say it, say why. Say it, say why. So off we go then. And at the top of these questions, you normally get a bit of information. So we'll go and check out that information at the top. And once we've done that, we'll look at the first of the stories. You're a manager, uh, audit department, reviewing audit working papers. It always says that. Year ended 31st of July, 2014. Oh, didn't want that, sorry. Uh, right, 2014. Now I find uh, I have to keep going back into stories and finding important information, either highlight it or why not write it up at the top of your answer so you know where it is. And a little reminder, please, that this exam paper was December 2014 which means that that year end, August, September, October, November, and a few days into December, was four months ago. Which means I'm already looking at that year end and thinking, ooh, if there's any accounting issue in here where what happens after the year end is relevant, I've got four whole months of things that have happened after the year end, which are potentially relevant and the audit team should have got evidence about. Now I'm going to put some information up there, so I'm just going to box it off. Uh, it is a group, which might prove to be important somewhere in the answer. Your firm audits all components of the group which consists of a parent and three subsidiaries, Marks, Roberts, and Teapot. The group manufactures engines, which are then supplied to the car industry. The draft consolidated financial statements. Right, here we go. We've got two numbers. We've got profit for the year of 23 and total assets. Of 450. No revenue figure, but profit of 23, total assets of 450.
And as we know, those numbers will be useful for materiality calculations in a little while. You will also have seen that last year's comparative figures were given. Those will prove to be important if at some point when we read the story, we start thinking of prior period adjustments. In most questions, last year's numbers are not relevant, but they might be, so we'll just keep those in the background for now. Information in respect of three issues has been highlighted for your attention during the file review. Right, here we go then. There is story A. First thing I notice is it's worth 12 marks. So my starting point is to aim for six of matters and six bits of evidence. So I'm already thinking, let's go and find a number in the accounts which looks important and I can do materiality. And let's try to find six things in the story that look like they are worth checking. Here we go then. An equity shareholding, 80% in teapot was acquired on the 1st of August 2013. So on day one of the accounting year, they have acquired a new subsidiary. 80% would probably indicate control. But I'm talking accounting rules and they're difficult, so let's think of easier marks I can get. That's an event which the auditors should have checked. So this at the moment is an answer plan. And we'll have matters and we'll have evidence. And if they have purchased 80% of a company on the 1st of August, one piece of evidence is going to be the purchase agreement. And we'll look at what I'd actually write in full very shortly. One piece of evidence. Hooray! Good start. Goodwill on the acquisition of 27 million was calculated at that date and remains recognised as an intangible asset at that value at the year end. And then we have a calculation of the 27 million. Well, goodwill is apparently in the year end accounts of 27 million. I wonder how material that is. Please don't divide it by profit. It's not in the profit or loss account. It's in the statement of financial position. So divide it by 450 million of assets. Now, hopefully you've got a calculator, but here's a quick little tip. Use a little bit of common sense. 1% of 450 is 4.5. 1% of assets is where we start to think material. 27 is a lot more than 4.5. So clearly this should end up being material and if you now get your calculator out and do a calculation and claim it's not material, you're going to look a bit silly. So to avoid silly mistakes, have a quick look at the numbers and do a bit of mental arithmetic. Now I'm quite good at mental arithmetic, which is good because I don't have a calculator here. If 4.5 is 1%, then 9 is 2% and 27 is 3 times 9 and 3 times 2 is 6%. And that is material. Wonderful. I've got a materiality mark sorted out and I've got one piece of evidence. Now I'm going to go after more evidence and then come back and look at the accounting afterwards. Okay, so Goodwill was 27 million. The Goodwill calculation says purchase consideration was 75. Well, that's a fact. So when I check the purchase agreement, I hope the auditors checked that there was 75 million of consideration. Fair value of 20% non-controlling interest. 
apparently 13. So check that it was an 80% purchase, and I suppose that the date was the 1st of August 2013. Fair value. Well, we're actually going to get two lots of fair value here, aren't we? The fair value of the 20% non-controlling interest and the fair value of Teapot's identifiable net assets at acquisition. Fair value sounds complicated to me. Maybe an expert's valuation of both the, was it 13? I forget already, non-controlling interest and the 61 net assets acquired. Now, when you buy another company, as you know from another part of this course, you tend to do something called due diligence. So when I say experts valuation, we're probably talking about a due diligence report. So I've got a document that the auditors should have looked at. Maybe not the easiest bit of evidence to dream up, but hey, we've got something at least. But with 12 marks available, I need a whole lot more. So what else is going on in the story? In determining the fair value of identifiable net assets at acquisition, an upwards fair value adjustment of 300,000 was made to the book value of a property recognized at a carrying value of 600,000. So if I'm reading that right, Teapot's financial statements, ooh, there's a piece of evidence. Have a property at 600, which someone thinks is worth 900. So we need another expert valuation on that property regarding the 300k uplift in value. Now I'm always nervous when I'm doing a question like this that maybe if I end up with evidence that looks similar to other evidence I won't be doubling up on the marks. So keep going and get as much of it as you can. A loan of 60 million was taken out on the 1st of August 2013. Ooh, another fact. And when you have a loan, you have a loan agreement. And we need to check it was for 60 million and it was on the 1st of August 2013. And if they have received 60 million in cash, surely their bank statements and cash book should show receipt of the 60 million. If they have purchased this thing for cash up front, then the bank statements and cash book should also show uh, the payment to buy the company of 75 million. So the auditors should have checked all of these things. Now, maybe you're ahead of the game here and you're thinking, Paul, loans have interest. Shouldn't we check the interest? And I say, yes, but you're trying to be too clever too early. Check the facts in the story first. The loan carries an annual interest rate. So it's going to tell you anyway of 6% with interest payments made annually in arrears. So that loan agreement, I should also check the C, not dollars, 6% interest rate which means now I'm thinking they borrowed it on the first day of the accounting year, the auditors should have recalculated an interest charge of 60 million times 6%, which is 3.6 million. Ooh, 3.6 million should be the interest charge in the accounts. So I'm now tempted to go up and do another materiality calculation just in case and say 3.6 million of interest 
divided by 23 million of profit. 2.3 million is 10%, and 10% is definitely material. It's way above that. Uh, oh, I haven't got a calculator. Uh, 2.3 is 10. 13, it's about 16%. Maybe there's two materiality marks here. Two separate things, both material, after all. Right, let's just audit our answer. How much evidence have we got? The purchase agreement, some sort of expert's valuation on stuff, Teapot's financial statements, maybe the other valuation on top of another valuation is too much, I don't know. The loan agreement makes four. The bank statements and cash book make five. A recalculation of the interest charge and we've got six marks plus materiality, and I have passed this. But the story keeps on giving. The loan will be repaid in 20 years at a premium of five million. So when I check that loan agreement, I'll also say I'll check uh, the five million premium and, uh, why do I keep writing dollar signs? 20 years. All I have done is said anything I read that looks like I can check it, I'll check it. Because my audit team should have done. Because if those facts aren't relevant to the accounting, why are the facts in the story? They've got to be relevant. Otherwise, why are you being told? Now, I suppose she might drop one thing in there that's not relevant and you end up checking it and it's pointless. Well, boo-hoo. One thing you've written doesn't get a mark. Everything else is going to. So just check everything. And that means I can take a little bit of a deep breath, calm down, and then I can look at the accounting issues. of which there are several. They have bought 80% of another company. Which means they should consolidate that sub because IFRS 10 says so. They also need to disclose their interest in that sub because IFRS 12 says so. Goodwill is the fair value of consideration minus the fair value of the net assets acquired. They have not acquired all 100%, so they've done an adjustment which effectively negates, strips out the non-controlling interest. Uh, and that is from IFRS 3. But we also know that Goodwill is subject to a year-end impairment test. Yet it's still at 27 million in the accounts, which means either they've not done a test or they did a test and decided that there was no impairment to the sub, which might be right, I don't know. They've also got a loan. IFRS 7 says loads of disclosures. IFRS 9 says this is a financial liability and as such should be held at amortized cost, which means they need to both accrue one year's interest, but also they need to accrue part of the five million premium. Now that is a lot of accounting rules to be discussed, which means the answer to this question could go crazy. And if your accounting's not very strong, you could be writing stacks of stuff that's just not technically good enough to be picking up many marks. 
On the other hand, there's a lot to have a go at, isn't there? Lots of accounting standards relevant to this story. So by all means, have a crack at some of it. Go for the easier accounting rules, if at all possible. Have they done it right? Well, the goodwill looks right to me. Assuming the numbers are the right numbers, that's a valid calculation. So that looks all right. Should they be updating the value of that property? Well, yes, because everything's done at fair value, so that's right as well. Uh, have they accounted for the loan correctly? Don't know, doesn't say. But there must be a risk that they've not accrued the interest and a risk they've done nothing with the premium. So I'd be mentioning all of that stuff if I had the time. I won't be mentioning the audit report for part A because there is nothing in that story which they have definitely done wrong. And that means I now have a working plan to write the answer. Now, I say a plan. Realistically, on exam day, you don't have time to write out the sort of plan I have and then write it out again in full. Which means you've got to go in here with the right technique and write your answer as you're spotting the issues. The reason I put a plan up there is to show you how I'm coming up with the content. Our next job is to actually write some of the answer and see how we go and take the issues and turn them into good solid marks. And when we come back from a short break, that's exactly what we're going to do. So we'll have a little break at that point just so I can get a quick glass of water. And when we come back, we will race through uh, I'm going to try and keep this break fairly short, so about three minutes or so. Uh, I will turn off the presentation during the break, but we'll be back very shortly, so don't you go nowhere. See you soon.